We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. Jim Belmont, master criminal, has been taken into custody by federal officers. Belmont, who is wanted in almost every state in the Union for daring and spectacular crimes, is at this moment being rushed to the West Coast by train. There, he will stand trial on a series of charges which, if he is convicted, will condemn him to the lethal gas chamber. Now, back to our program. So, the news is out. The public now knows that the law has caught up with the notorious Jim Belmont. Not only the general public, Mr. Jeffries, my own friends, too. I think they'll know what to do about it. Don't build up false hopes, Belmont. This is your last ride, that's certain. <laughs> Nothing in life is absolutely certain, my friend. Would you mind turning the dial to station PDR? It's 9 o'clock and I'd like to hear the symphony program. Sure, why not? That's our signal, the 9 o'clock symphony. All right, you can take her down. I'm ready. Jeffries, nothing in life is absolutely certain. One moment, Farrell. This theme is very beautiful. Better hurry up, Chief. We'll soon be at the top of the grade. The train will be picking up speed in a minute. again. I've missed my music. How have you been, Morton? Fine, sir. Do you have the information I wanted about the expected visit of the Countess Del Remy? Well, not exactly. I found out she's the emissary and the personal representative of the Grand Duchess Cornelia, and she'll be the guest of Mrs. Van Brock. Yes, I know. All that was in the newspapers. What I want to know is when and how the Countess will arrive. Well, I tried to find out. I questioned the Van Brock servants and checked the transportation lines. But I had no luck. There's no such thing as luck. 
You have to use your brain. During a political upheaval two years ago, the Countess brought the crown jewels of the Grand Duchess to this city and deposited them in a bank vault. Which bank? We'll learn that when we get the Countess. She's returning to take the jewels home for the coronation. And there's sure to be information about her arrival in the files of the investigation department office. You want us to go there? Of course. We must strike quickly, before they replace Jeffries, and while the police believe that I'm still a helpless fugitive. Here you are, Sonny. Gee, thanks, miss. This is what we want. Listen. Carlos Del Ramey arrives by plane 2 p.m. today. Provide adequate protection. That's it. Let's get started. Did you wish to see someone? I'm Jerry Blake, operator 99, taking over for Tom Jeffries. I presume you were his secretary. Yes, and I hope I proved satisfactory to you, Mr. Blake. This is my fiancé, Mr. Riggs. He just dropped in to take me to lunch. How do you do? Hello. I'm sorry to delay you, but before you go, would you please get me the folder on Jim Belmont? Why, yes, of course. All right, Rita. I've got him covered. Oh, nice work. I was stopped for a minute. Suppose you run along. You've got what we came after. Fix him so that he can't raise an alarm. Don't worry. I'll take care of him. You won't get away with this, Riggs. Get in that closet. All right, get in there. Untied in just a second. Thanks a lot. Aren't you Operator 99? That's right. Jerry Blake's the name. I'm taking over until Jeffries recovers. I'm Joyce Kingston, Mr. Jeffries' secretary. Wonder what those people were after. I don't know. Well, whatever it was, they got it. These files were all locked, and there's nothing in the desk that anyone would want. Well, I was expecting a telegram from Washington. You were. I didn't receive it. It could have come when I was tied up in the closet. That must be what they got. You'd better go to the telegraph office and get a repeat on any message that was sent. Meanwhile, I'll phone the police about the man. So the Countess will arrive at the airport at 2 o'clock. You've done very well, my dear. Thanks, Jim. Besides making a fool of the famous operator 99. Don't underrate Jerry Blake. You'll never meet a more dangerous enemy. This is it, Mr. Blake. Listen. Thomas Del Ramey arrives by plane 2 p.m. today. Provide adequate protection. It's almost 2 o'clock now. Do you think the Countess is in danger? She will be if I don't get to the airport in time. Countess Del Ramey arrived a short time ago and she was met by someone. Did you get a picture of her? I tried to, but a big lug of a chauffeur blocked me off. He said she was traveling incognito and there were orders out she was not to be photographed. Listen, don't kid me, Mac. I've known you too long. When your paper sends you out to get a picture, you get it. No matter who orders what. No, honest, Jerry. Look, I'm not trying to pin anything on you. The Countess is in danger, and I've got to find out who those people are. Can't you help me? Oh, well. I did get one snap with the little box. But don't you get me in a jam. Thanks a lot, Mac. You won't get into any trouble. And I'll return this as soon as I get the film developed. There you are, Jerry. And it's nice and clear. Thanks, Fred. That was quick work. Why, that's the girl that impersonated me here in the office. Her name's Rita. And I know that chauffeur. His name is Matt Farrell. He's Belmont's gunman and chief assistant. 
As I suspected, we're up against Jim Belmont. By now, the Countess is in his hands. And there's not much chance to trace this outfit. I wouldn't say that. This car is a foreign make, a Cordova. There can't be more than three or four of them in town. And I think we can locate this one by a careful check of the rental agencies. That's the place, all right. The foreign car is in there. The proprietor's name is Johnny Daniels. This is Jerry Blake. Give me the regular circuit. Operator, I want Melville 8121. All right, do your stuff. Hello, Johnny. This is Rita. We've got to move the counters to another place. The boss wants you to get a car out here right away. Yes, and make it snappy. He said he'd start right away. He's coming. Honored by your presence, Countess. I trust that by now you have complied with my wishes. I have the key to her safety deposit box, but she refuses to tell which bank it's in. I feel quite sure she will give me the name of the bank. I shall tell you precisely nothing, sir. That is unfortunate, madame. I had hoped to secure the information without unpleasantness. You are a beautiful woman, Countess. And it always distresses me to see beauty marred. I turn her over to you, my dear. Certain you wouldn't remain stubborn, Countess. It is the First National Bank of Glenview. But this knowledge will be useless to you. They have orders to open the box for no one but me. I have means of persuading people, uh, as you have just seen, Countess. When I have the crown jewels in my hands, you'll be released. Thank you for your cooperation. Me, the boss wanted a car to move the counters. She didn't call anybody from here. They're on their way now to get the stuff. Some dame phoned and said she was Rita. This must be a trap. I'll radio Belmont in his car. All right, put him up. Quick! Look out! The other one! of the First National Bank in Glenview. Belmont took my key, but the bank has orders not to deliver them. 
Jim Belmont will have a trick or two that will offset anyone's orders. This is my secretary, Miss Kingston. Will you take the Countess to Mrs. Van Brock's house? I'm on my way to the Glenview Bank. How do you do? Hello. I have some family silver I'd like to have locked up for a few days while I'm out of town. Fill out this form, please. Surely. Here's the key, sir. Thank you, Benson. Lock this up in the strong room, will you, Benson? Yes, sir. It will only be for a little while and be a great convenience to me. We're happy to be of service to you. Thank you. Everything is working smoothly. Calling F2. D1, calling F2. F2 speaking. Come in, Chief. We're ready to go. Start ruling. The keys are in the top left-hand drawer of the information desk. The case will blow up in two minutes. Right. Let's go. I'll turn in the alarm. Where's the fire? In the safety vault in the basement, Chief. the result of perfect planning and timing, my dear? Yes, but Farrell had better be out of there before the real firemen arrive. We heard the explosion. The fire's in there, back of the vault, in that back. Glad you got here. This won't put it out. Why doesn't he hurry?
see how you can be so calm when there's so much at stake. From your manner, Farrell, it's obvious that you've had trouble. Yeah. Operator 99 tried to stop our getaway, but we ran him off the road. I wonder how he found out we were at the bank. He tricked Johnny into leading him to the place we held the Countess prisoner. A cool million. A hot million. <laughs> These jewels must be on hand for the coronation or there'll be serious political trouble. I'm sure the Countess will pay handsomely for their return. Say, a uh, quarter of a million? What? Don't be foolish, Jim. You can get double that amount if you sell them to the right dealer. I said she'd pay well, but I didn't say I was going to return the jewels. I get it. We'll have the money and the jewels. Exactly. But... The Countess will be so heavily guarded, none of us will be able to reach her with a proposition. I know that. So we shall approach her through an honest, reliable citizen whose integrity is unquestioned. Her own legal representative, Warren Hunter. What did you do following this mysterious phone call, Mr. Hunter? I went to the Countess Del Remy first, as ordered by Belmont's representative. She wants to pay the ransom, but she insists that you handle the money. She asks only that you do nothing to jeopardize the deal. It's against the policy of our department to pay ransom. We'll use our own means to recover the jewels. But that'll take time. The Countess must return them to her country for the coronation or there'll be serious trouble. Possibly a revolution. Please reconsider, Mr. Blake. Did Belmont agree that I should handle the transaction? Conditionally. If you'll stay out of the setup yourself and send the money by someone else, he'll take a chance. They're phoning my office at 3 o'clock for a definite answer. I'll do it in my own way. Tell them that my secretary, Miss Kingston, will deliver the money. As soon as she gives it to them and gets the jewels, she'll radio me. Following which, I will go into action and use every trick I know to get Belmont. That seems to be a fair proposition. I'll let you know his answer. Beautiful. It's a shame we have to break them up. Yes, they're a great deal more valuable as they are. But they're much too well known. I could never dispose of them. But I'll have to examine the stones very carefully so I can determine the best way to recut them. Everything's set. Blake's secretary will bring the money, and he's agreed to lay off until it's delivered. As soon as she gets the jewel, she's to radio him. Then he'll start looking for you. <laughs> Won't he be surprised when they don't get the jewels? Don't laugh. He's very clever, and he probably has a plan. Our job is to see that he doesn't get a chance to use it. The first thing you must do when you get the money is to wreck the car radio. Rita, get word to him through Hunter that we accept his conditions. He's to have his secretary drive north on Highway 6 and they'll contact him. Right. the jewels first. Uh-huh. They're all right. And I've got a little surprise for you. You're not gonna get the jewels. It's the old double cross, sister. But the agreement. Blake must be pretty dumb to fall for it. <laughs> Just so you don't radio him. Or get to a phone. Calling 
operator 99. Calling operator 99. Go ahead, Joyce. Everything worked out as you said it would. Farrell has the money and is riding the motorcycle north along the highway. Fine work. We'll trail him wherever he goes. Follow him and climb higher so that he won't spot us. until Heinrich finishes cutting the jewels. Don't move. All right, get over there. Turn around. All right, put the jewel case in that bag with the money.
he's done for. It'll be a cinch to fish out the jewels and the money. We'll have to come back later. There's been a slip-up somewhere. Blake couldn't have trailed us to the cave. They probably have a dragnet out. Stolen jewels recovered. Operator 99, Outwits Crime Syndicate. The daring attempt of Jim Belmont to collect ransom for the jewels of the Archduchess Cornelia was frustrated by a more daring and resourceful government operator. But I still haven't caught Jim Belmont. You'll catch him, Jerry. It's just a matter of getting a real lead. I've been trying to get a clue by checking up on some of the men that were associated with him in the past. The best bet seems to be Monty Mason. He made plenty of money for Belmont. It took an expert to spot his counterfeit. But Mason was eventually retired to the penitentiary. That's right. But recently he was paroled. Now he's working for the Burroughs Engraving Company on Fifth Street. It wouldn't take Belmont long to learn that and get in touch with Mason. That's exactly why I'm going to pay him a little visit. So when the company put me on here as night watchman, they said they'd give me some engraving jobs if I made good. So uh, I'm really trying to go straight. How about the crooks, Mason? Will they let you? They've got nothing to do with it. I'm my own boss. I can't imagine you saying that to Jim Belmont. I did say that to Jim Belmont. Not personally, because no one gets near him except his closest pals. But I did send word that I was through. And he sent word right back that you'd continue to make counterfeit for him, or be a corpse. Yeah, you're right. I'm in a tough spot. Supposing I get you out of it? How? By letting you help me catch Belmont? by pretending to make counterfeit for him. Pretend? What do you mean, pretend? I'd have to deliver the goods, wouldn't I? And you would. Goods made by Uncle Sam. You mean give him real money? Of course. He'll have an easy time passing it, and you'll be able to gain his confidence completely. I get it. When he bites, you'll send word that you want a larger cut. He'll refuse. But you stand pat and say that the matter can't be handled by go-betweens. Then he'll have to arrange to see you personally. That's where I step in. You game? Sure. But I have to laugh when I think of Belmont passing real dough, believing it's counterfeit. Monty Mason must have done postgraduate work in the penitentiary. His new bills are almost good enough to fool the Treasury Department. Yeah, but Mason's balking. He wants a bigger cut. How big? 50-50. Go back and tell him I'll decide that. It won't do any good. He wants to see you personally and have an understanding. Oh, but Jim, you can't let him come here. Or go to his place. He's still on parole and the cops will be checking up on him. I'll arrange a meeting with him. Then we'll persuade him to send for his plates. After we have those, then we won't need him. You certainly called all the turns, Blake. I didn't think Belmont would ever agree to a meeting. Well, he's probably short of cash. But remember, he'll take plenty of precautions. How do you explain the box? Well, I told him I was bringing along a bundle of bills to show my good intentions. That's fine. Well, I'm all set. Unless they send somebody that will recognize you. A very little danger of that. They send a different man every time they contact me. Another new guy. You're a cinch. Good luck. You're a Mason. Right. How do I know who you are? You wanted a meeting with Belmont, Farrell phoned, and I'm here. Sounds okay. I'll have to take that gun. Belmont's orders. More orders. More red tape seeing this guy than they're seeing the president.
Here he is. Okay, I'll take care of him. Is Belmont here? No, Mason, but he'll be here in a few minutes. this blindfold now. Blake. Get your hands up. Joyce, you can come in now. We seem to be doing all right. Belmont's due here any moment. Call the police and have them send out a squad car. May I have the chief of police? You're very careless, Mr. Blake. I'm too old a hand at this business to come through a front door. And as for you, Farrell, you're indeed fortunate you have me to look after you. Well, he had me fooled. I certainly can't understand how he horned in on this counterfeit money deal. There never was any counterfeit. Our friend, Mr. Blake, baited his trap with real money. He got it from a source that has billions. Consequently, he shouldn't consider me greedy if I asked him to phone for, say, a hundred thousand to be delivered where and as I designate. That's impossible. Nothing is impossible. Step over there. This is the incinerator for burning the waste products of the tannery. You will observe that it works on the same principle as a crematorium. This valve turns on a highly inflammable gas, which fills the furnace rapidly, as you can see. This switch throws a spark which ignites the gas. Well, Blake, what shall it be? The cash for me or cremation for Miss Kingston? I'll see what I can do. Don't let him bluff you, Jerry. He wouldn't dare. Oh, wouldn't I? Shall I turn it on? No. I'll phone.
Stop prowling around, Farrell. I'm afraid you don't appreciate good music. Oh, I was just thinking of Blake. I wish we'd have finished him. We'll have other chances. We're bound to run into him sooner or later in the course of our activities. Hello? Just a minute. It's for you, Jim. Long distance from Washington. Yes? Oh, hello, Zorko. Did you obtain that information? Splendid. I'll take care of everything at this end and contact you later. Goodbye. So it was Zorko. At what keyhole has he been listening this time? A fine way to refer to an international agent. He's been listening at a very important keyhole. Snyder, a government expert, is flying here with plans for a jet propulsion plane that will transport freight at half the present cost would put all other plane manufacturers out of business. I don't see where we come in on that. It's very simple. If we get those plans, we can sell them to a foreign government at our own price. Snyder's due on the 3 o'clock plane. That gives you and Rita plenty of time to carry out a little plan I prepared. Are you Mr. Snyder? Yes. I'm Mr. Blake's secretary. He was out when your telegram arrived, so I came to meet you myself. Thank you. in the car, Rita. There's nothing here but a lot of numbers. 72, 61. 33, 42, and so on. That's what we want. It's in code, just like Belmont said. Then we'd better take her along with us. She works for Blake, so she must know the code. Yeah, come on. All right, call me back later. Now listen, all we want is the key to that code. Give us that and you can go. I've already told you that I don't know it. Yes, dear, but we don't believe you. Oh, we wasted too much time already. Sure, what'll happen if she won't talk?
to talk. Get the plans. Drink of water, please. All right, Miss Kingston. Now let's have all the answers. It's based on the telephone dial. This last slot is a key slot. I don't get it. Well, I'll mark it for you. Each of these double numbers represents a letter. For instance, 31, you dial 3. Then in the last slot, you get MNO. So which letter is it, M, N, or O? It's M, because the 1 in 31 means the first letter. For 53, you dial 5, then you get G, H, I. But the 3 in 53 means the third letter, I. For 63, you dial 6, and you take the third letter, F. For 52, you dial 5, and you take the second letter, H. Uh-huh, it's beginning to make sense. For 41, you dial 4, and you take the first letter, J. For 83, you dial 8. That's all there is to the code. Now, will you let me go? It's Joyce. She's a prisoner somewhere. Have the call traced on the other phone. Operator, trace the call coming in on Fleetwood 6548. All right, Rita. Take these plans over to Belmont and let him decode them. All right. You keep Miss Kingston here until you hear from Belmont. See you later. Connection's been cut. Thank you, operator. It's the airplane motor repair shop, 721 Watson Street. Stand by, Fred. It doesn't work out. It's just a lot of meaningless syllables. She fooled you, Rita. She's stalling for time, but it won't help her. All right, Jim, leave it to me. So you gave us the runaround, huh? Well, you won't fool us this time. Get over there. For the last time, did we get that code? No. All right, you've had your chance. Get your hands up. Untie that girl.
coded plans are of a jet-propelled cargo plane capable of carrying a tremendous load at a fraction of the present cost. Belmont expects to cash in on them. He'll have to work fast. Surely no legitimate plane builder would touch them. No, but Belmont has probably already contacted a foreign customer through one of his international agents. I'm sure that no agent would buy the plans unless they were decoded. Belmont can't do that. It's a job for an expert. He'll get an expert. I've learned there are three men in town capable of cracking that code. Belmont will probably try to force one of them to do the job. Then all three of those men are in danger. Yes, I've already notified the chief of police to guard them. The next thing to do is... It's all right, I'll get it. Yes? Oh, hello, chief. Have your men stay there. I'll be right out. It's too late. One of the code experts, Professor Crawford, was taken from the house before the police could get there. I'm going over and see what I can find out. This list of books had better be the McCoy, or the boys will work you over again. It's correct. Get them and I'll decode the plans for you. I'm taking this to Belmont. Take care of Crawford, boys. He's the same as money in the bank. Professor Crawford decoded the plan so soon? Not yet, but we convinced him. And now he's willing to do the job. He needs some of his books on codes. Says it'll take him weeks to decode the plans unless he has them. Are you sure he's not using this to gain time in hopes of being rescued? Oh, he's in no shape to stall. Do you want one of the boys to go over to the professor's house for the books? And run into the police? The place is certain to be watched. No. Look, my dear, you have a card. Go to the library and get these books. Right. Did you get a lead on Professor Crawford? Yes. From Mrs. Crawford's description of the men who took the professor, I'm positive one of them was Farrell. Was she able to tell you anything else? When the professor is working out involved codes, he uses such books as cryptography, the science of codes, and military cryptanalysis, and others. They're still on his shelves. Belmont must know that by now. He also knows that the police are watching Crawford's house. But the public library carries the same books. When I went down there to put a stop order on them, they had already been withdrawn on a card issued to Rita Parker. Rita Parker? The card was issued over a year ago. And the address given was a cheap nightclub called the Blue Monday. Should be opening pretty soon. I'll phone you later. We won't be open for another hour. I'm an officer. That's different. Anything I can do for you? I'm checking up on a girl named Rita Parker. Know her? Yes, she used to be an entertainer here a year or two ago. Do you know where she lives? No. Does she ever come in here anymore? Oh, yes, drops in once in a while. Have a few drinks with some of my old customers that used to know her when she worked here. I'd like to question those people. So I think I'll stick around. Supposing you point them out to me when they come in. Why, sure, make yourself right at home. Care for a drink? No, thanks. I'll just look at this until you open. Fine. 
I'll play a little music to help pass the time. What number did you wish played? A change of heart. We have that selection. Just a moment, please. That number is Hind Signal of Trouble. It means that we're to stay away from the nightclub. <laughs> okay. We're too busy to go there tonight anyway. Gotta make a phone call. Jerry. Now listen carefully, I've got a hot clue. Find out the address for the output wire to the museograph located at the Blue Monday nightclub. You got that? As soon as you get it, call me back here. The number's Dalton, 1696. Go to the plans? Not yet. Hines just sent a warning that we're to stay away from the Blue Monday. Must be some cops there. Turn on the speaker. I want to know exactly what's going on there. I'm expecting a call. I'll take it. That's Blake. Hello? Yes. 362 High Street. Thanks, Joyce. Get your hat. You're going with me. What's the big idea? You got nothing on me. Just this. You said you didn't know where Rita Parker was. And I just recognized a voice over the museograph. You're under arrest. headquarters with me. Cops will never make me squeal on Belmont. They don't have to. I had the museograph line traced. I know where to find him. So he's coming here to get me. How interesting. We couldn't ask for anything better. First thing, you two watch from the front room. And when he arrives... Blake, all right. I'll tell Belmont. Yes? Blake's coming in. We're ready for him.
light flashes, pull the lever. Right. You'd better follow him in case anything goes wrong. Operator 99. Untie Crawford. Have him finish decoding the plans. Okay. Up with him, both of you. Blake. Right. It's your own man stepped into the trap. Toss your guns away. Keep your hands up, Belmont, while your pal unties Professor Crawford. Untie him. Drop your gun and get your hands up, Blake. Well done, my dear. Now get rid of him. Belmont, but you're going to help me find him. Get in there. Rita Parker held for trial on charges of extortion. It is expected that the grand jury will indict Rita Parker, member of the Jim Belmont organization. If found guilty, she faces a long prison term. But she won't be found guilty. She won't even be brought to trial. You should know by now, Farrell, that I always take care of my people. Yeah? Well, you'll find that county jail mighty tough to crack. True. But Rita isn't in the county jail. Mr. Blake has very thoughtfully held her in personal custody. She's held in the detention room which adjoins his office. So it'd be relatively simple to rescue her from there. Hold it. Thank you. Now, one more picture, Miss Parker. Give us a smile you're going to use on the jury and the judge. Oh, now, listen, boys. Don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. <laughs> there won't be any judge or any jury. Take my word for it. All right. Now, hold it. You. All right, boys. On your way. Show's over. Well, thank you very much, Miss Parker. Keep an eye on her, Corwin. Sorry, I forgot my flash bulbs. I'll get it. I knew Jim would get me out of here. Who are you? Lock the door. Fireman's nest stretched out in that truck underneath the tarpaulin cover. Fine. The jump isn't so bad. 
I can make it. Yeah, Belmont told me you could take care of yourself. Open up, Corwin. It's Blake. and clear out of here. All right, Tony. Nice work. Nice, huh? If you'd have started that punch two inches further back, I'd have been out for good. If Rita leads us to Jim Belmont, it was worth it. I'm on my way. Highway 78, heading east on Spruce Road. Good work. Keep me posted. Operator 99. Thanks for springing me, Jim. What are you talking about? We were planning a surprise for Blake tomorrow, but I had nothing to do with your release. Why, the photographer helped me escape from Blake's place. Never mind the details. Blake framed it and you stepped into his trap. We'll have to get out of here. Take a look outside. Here, Belmont, you have an appointment with Mr. Blake. Get your hands up, both of you. What'll I do with her? Watch the door. Sit down. Tie her up. So I have an appointment with Mr. Blake, have I? Sorry, I can't keep it but I shall arrange a warm reception for him when he arrives. We can still use a little device. Attach this wire to the bar of the door so that when it's opened, it seems very fitting that Mr. Blake should take you with him on his last journey, what I should call poetic justice if I believed in justice. Finish up and clear out before the blast. Jim Belmont's business. And when your boyfriend lifts this bar, it's curtains for both of them.
Take it easy. Everything will be all right. I'll have you untied in a second. every one of them away. Guess who's dead? Make it Blake and we'll celebrate. Nick Banyan, Jim's old partner. Banyan, huh? We'll omit the flowers. Let's hear the details. Underworld leader and former partner of Jim Belmont passes away. Death, which the guns of his henchmen had so often dealt to his gangland enemies, last night claimed Nick Banyan. In his will, which was open this morning, Banyan made bequests of $10,000 each to four of his henchmen. Rocky Davis, Chuck Weeks, Sam Toller, and Burt Banks. Did you read this paper? <laughs> no. But I know who's who in the lower crust. Does it say anything about his hidden gold? The biggest of the alleged Banyan Halls was the holdup of an armored truck and the theft of 250,000 in gold bullion. According to the underworld rumors, Banyan deposited the gold in a secret hiding place. It's more than a rumor. I know definitely the gold is secreted somewhere. I couldn't go after it while Nick was alive, but now I can. Except for the fact that you haven't any clues as to where it's hidden. Rocky Davis and his three gunmen were close enough to Banyan to know. Besides, there's his lawyer. Otto Wolf. Wolf's a shrewd gentleman. So we'll go after the gunman first. Four die in gang slaying. Paris nightclub scene of killings. Lying face downwards in pools of blood, the bullet riddled bodies of four men were found today in the cellar of the Paris nightclub. The men, mutilated as the result of inhuman torture, apparently were lined up against a wall and shot down, setting a new high in ruthlessness the crime is one of the most shocking in police annals. Isn't that the club Nick Banyan owned? That's right. And the murdered men were his bodyguards. I'm positive they were killed at Belmont's orders. Belmont's? Must have been. Belmont's the only criminal in the city with an organization strong enough to tackle Banyan's gunmen. He's undoubtedly trying to find out what happened to the hidden gold bullion. You probably remember reading about it at the time that Banyan died. I did, but it seemed like a fantastic rumor. Yes, but it wasn't. I happen to know because it's a case that I started my career on. We got Banyan indicted, but were unable to get a conviction. However, we got Wolf, his attorney, disbarred for subornation of perjury and... Wait a minute. I must be slipping. I'm standing here chattering while another man is probably getting murdered right now. If Belmont didn't get that information from the gunman, he's bound to go after the attorney. Call Hildale, 6782. We won't bother answering that, Wolf. No, Mark. Don't be alarmed, my friend. I'm really dropped in to discuss a little business deal. 
No answer. But he's always home. He can't move. He's a paralytic. I'd better get over there right away. If Daniel had any hidden gold, I didn't know anything about it. These boys didn't know either. They discovered the folly of being ignorant. I'm half dead anyway. But I don't relish your methods of extracting information. You said something about a deal? Tell me where the gold is and I'll split 50-50 with you. As you say, I could extract the information. But I can afford to be generous with an old friend. Can I send a man along to protect my interest? Of course. Take any precautions you wish. So, uh, let's have it. Where's the bullion hidden? You remember that big sedan of Banyan's, the one that he had rebuilt? Yes. Well, the bullion was melted down and built in the car. That car is practically pure gold. Painted over. <laughs> Smart fellow, that Banyan. Too bad we couldn't get along. Where is the car stored? In the terminal storage building on the fifth floor. I know where the building is. Call your man and we'll arrange to have him meet Farrell and get the car. It's all set, Hood. Pick up Farrell and go to the storage place. Hood doesn't know about the gold in the car. For a quarter of a million dollars, I wouldn't trust him or Farrell. I can't trust anyone either, Otto. So I'm sure you won't object if I leave Dorgan here until I get the car. the front door bell. Don't answer it. Just a minute. Belmont didn't say anything Belmont about it. Belmont was only giving you a line. He doesn't like to watch rough stuff. When he phones me, he's got the car. That's your sign off. Jesse went away. Tell him to come in. Come in. Mr. Wolf, I raise it. Mr. Wolf, 
Where's Jim Belmont? Gone to get Banyan's gold car. Where? Fifth floor. Terminal storage building. wants it. Darn if I know. Well, get a battery. I'll get her ready. Bring up the elevator. All right. Put your hands up. This will bring all the cops in town. I'll get rid of him. of Operator 99. Then we dredged the sedan out of the water. It's certainly the most valuable car in the world. It was a quarter million dollars in gold built into the body. And Belmont almost got it. Unfortunately, we didn't get Belmont. Headquarters is getting impatient over the fact that he's still at large. I'll have to answer their letter tonight. Oh, don't bother. I'll dictate it on the machine and you can type it up tomorrow. All right. Good night, Jerry. Good night, Joyce. Confidential data in the Belmont case. In Jim Belmont, we are dealing with a criminal genius. Following his spectacular escape from custody, he did not hide out like the average criminal. Instead, he conceived a daring plan to steal the crown jewels of the Archduchess Cornelia from the Glenview Bank. Lock this up in the strong room, will you, Benson? Yes, sir. It will only be for a little while and be a great convenience to me. We're happy to be of service to you. Thank you. Everything is working smoothly. 
Calling F2. D1, calling F2. F2 speaking. Come in, Chief. We're ready to go. Start rolling. The keys are in the top left-hand drawer of the information desk. The case will blow up in two minutes. Right. Let's go. Get the fire extinguisher. I'll turn in the alarm. Fire. In the safety vault in the basement, Chief. You see the result of perfect planning and timing, my dear? Yes, but Farrell had better be out of there before the real firemen arrive. <laughs> Glad you got here. This won't put it out. Why doesn't he hurry? There he is. Burn my face. I have to get to a hospital. Belmont's methods reveals one dominant characteristic. He has, as his associates, only expert criminals. This suggests a method of drawing him into the open. Theft of rare paintings still unsolved. Looting of City Museum remains a mystery. Police are at a loss to guess how the theft was engineered. With guards on watch inside and at every door, an unidentified man performed the impossible feat of stealing the painting. I'd like to meet the man who had talent enough to do it right under the noses of the police. Talking about the museum robbery? Yes. I found out who did it. Who was it? A guy by the name of Shaw. I found out about it from Harris, one of the boys. Shaw was smart enough to steal the pictures all right, but now he doesn't know how to dispose of them. They're too hot. We could sell those paintings to our agents in the East. Shaw would probably be glad to get a small cut. Get word to him that I'll meet him and make a deal with him. Better make this a good job, Ed. Have to meet Belmont face to face. How close do you expect to get to him? Close enough to handcuff him, I hope. He fell for the story I planted about the museum robbery. Finally, a message filtered through that Belmont would meet Shaw 
9 o'clock tonight in the rear of a building on Garrick Street. Well, you will be sure. I've been making up our operators for 10 years and I've never had a complaint yet. How does he look, Miss Kingston? Put the wig on him so I can get a better idea. It changes you completely, Jerry. Well, I only hope it fools Belmont tonight. What do you want here? I'm Shaw. Just a minute, Shaw. What's the idea? Just to make sure you don't have a gun. Okay. Go down those steps to the basement. Shaw. Unroll those paintings so that I can see them. All right. Don't move. It's an arrest, Belmont. Ah, uh, yes. I recognize your voice now, Blake. But you've aged a lot lately, haven't you? I'll feel a lot younger when you're behind bars. You'll never put me there. Pleasant surprise for anyone who tried to double cross me. The bulletproof glass was part of it. Now, you'll get the rest. The second night of been a goner. Where's Belmont? He's on the other side of those flames. Let's find another way to get into this place. And Belmont managed to escape through a secret exit. Carlson, the man that Joyce captured, refused to tell us anything. However, I did find this blueprint in his pocket. It's a slim lead, but it may tell us where Belmont plans to strike next. It looks like a large industrial plant of some kind. Yes, it does. But it only shows part of a plant and there's no name on it. Apparently in this corner there are two large tanks marked chemical settling tanks. That's our clue. Only a plant handling chemicals in large quantities would use such large tanks. Well, that's true, except that hundreds of plants use chemicals, and it'll take a long time to find out which one this is. Nevertheless, I must locate the owner of this particular plant and warn him. I think I know how we can save a little time. First of all, Joyce will want to know the names of all plants in the city that have permits to store chemicals. Go to the fire commissioner's office and get a list of all such permits issued to plants in the city. I'll get a similar list from the county. Right. Fred, you'd better make a couple of copies of the blueprint. We'll each need one to check with. Obviously, you have good news. I'll say I have. Everything's set. The armored car will deliver the payroll to the Tacoma Chemical Company at 3.30 sharp. Fine, fine. We'll go over the plans once more. Give me the blueprint. But I gave it to Carlson. He was going to work with me on the job. That means Blake has it now and we're in trouble. It won't do him any good. I tore all the names off of it. Well, at least you thought of that. If 
If anyone but Blake had it, I wouldn't worry. Nevertheless, we'll go ahead as planned. Rita, call Morton. Tell him to get over here in a hurry. I have a little scheme. I'll keep Blake so busy he won't have time to interfere. Have the county list. Did Joyce get back yet? Yes, she did. She picked up her copy of the blueprint. She's out checking on it now. Great. Then I'll get to work on mine. Hello? Yes. Just a moment. Jerry, it's for you. Hello? Yes. Mr. Blake, this is Charles Bedford of the Bedford Chemical Company. Our company manufactures a secret compound for the government, and I'm afraid someone's going to attempt to steal the formula. Well, what makes you think so? Well, just recently, we discharged one of our men for snooping around my office. And now we find that a blueprint of our plant has disappeared. I'm very glad you phoned me, Mr. Bedford. I have the missing blueprint right here, and I've been trying to identify it. I'd advise you to put on an extra guard at once, and I'll try to pick up the man you mentioned. Could you give me his name and address? Norton Corby. He lives at 362 Home Street, room 24. I'll check on the man immediately. Thank you, Mr. Bedford. Last the break. I'm on my way. Come in. Up with him, Blake. So the great operator 99 walks right into Belmont's trap, just like any ordinary mug. We all slip sometime. Yeah, but this is your last time. Better turn around. I never did like to shoot a guy in the back. Tell me. All right, we'll both answer it. Say yes or no as I direct. Hello? Corby, has Blake arrived? No. He's due there any minute. When you dispose of him, go to the road outside the Tacoma chemical plant and cover Farrell's getaway. Understand? Yes. So it's the Tacoma Chemical Company. Can't do it now, because the armored car with the payroll is due. Besides, you boys will have to wait outside until the money is checked and deposited in the safe. Rules, you know. Well, I wouldn't want to break any rules. Oh, uh, you can take the soiled towels with you as you go.
She would have to show up now. That armored car will be here any minute. What'll we do with her? Get some towels out of that hamper and we'll tie her up. See you next week. Okay, Joe. One peep out of you and you're finished. so he can't give an alarm. I'll get the money. Must have stopped Blake, too. Good. That takes care of both of them. You better pull up here a minute so I can close the door in the back.
calling all cars, calling all cars. Stop and investigate all Green Star laundry trucks. Search for Matt Farrell and Rita Parker, wanted for payroll robbery. Farrell is attired in Green Star laundry outfit. That is all. If it identified Farrell and Rita, it means Blake was on the scene. No matter what we plan, he blocks it. Yes, but it looks as though Farrell and Rita got away with the money. What good is the money if Blake gets the serial numbers of the bills and publishes them? And the laundry truck. He'll have every garage in town searched within 24 hours. We've got to get rid of it. I'd better call the garage. Yes, and tell Salko to have Farrell call me as soon as he gets there. Yeah, he wants you to call him. Hello, Jim. I had a little trouble with Blake. All right, I'll wait here. Bothering Jim. Blake's gotten out of broadcast. Now the cops are searching for us in the truck, so you'll have to get rid of it. Drive it out the back road into the hills and run it over a cliff into the lake. Well, what about you? I'm waiting here for Jim. He's coming here to pick up the money and then fly east with it. Pistol Belmont gets you. Right in there. You can hide there, too, if the cops show up. sure that the Tacoma Chemical Company was on Joyce's list? Positive. She may have arrived there at the time of the robbery. I... It's all right, I'll get it. Hello? Are you all right, Joyce? We've been worried about you. They carried me away in the laundry truck. Rita was trying to ditch it, but I got it away from her. Good girl. What happened to the payroll money? Farrell has it now and is in the super service garage on Fairfax Road. Belmont's going there to pick it up and fly east with it. I'll get right down there. Do you think you can get back here all right in the truck? Surely. Unless the police pull me in for the payroll robbery. You better get started. Right. Hold down the fort, Fred. I think we'll catch Belmont with the goods this time.
taken Belmont long enough to get here. He's probably having trouble arranging for the plane. I'll be back in a minute. I got to take this outside and make a fitting. Anything of Belmont's car? Nope. Maybe he's not coming. Why, of course he's coming. He's got to pick up the money. Then we'll be waiting for him. Blake. All right, put him up. So Sal Cole double-crossed me? No, he didn't. I took him by surprise and borrowed some of his clothes. All right, turn around. Put your hands behind you. a prisoner. Rita left in the truck. 
The usual paraphernalia. Hmm. A radio log. Look, someone has checked that piano concert. That's right. This program was broadcast yesterday. I wonder why it's marked. Well, Belmont's a musician. That's reason enough. Not for me. Jim Belmont has a motive for everything he does. P.A.G. It's a Kansas station. We'll wire them for a transcription of the program and have them send it by airmail. Maybe it will give us a clue to Belmont's next move. So now you understand, my dear, that it was necessary for me to hear the broadcast yesterday in order to learn when this pianist Carlotti would arrive in this city. Yes, I understand. Carlotti is coming here to play the accompaniments for this highbrow fiddler, Morello, at a concert. And you want to steal Morello's fiddle. Not just the fiddle, my dear. His Stradivarius violin. It may interest you to know that the instrument is valued at more than a hundred thousand dollars. A hundred grand? Oh, some fiddle. How are you going to get it? That is where Signor Carlotti will help us. With his assistance, I should have no difficulty whatsoever. You have just heard the final number of Signor Roberto Carlotti's farewell program over this station. This world-renowned artist leaves tonight for a concert engagement on the West Coast, where he will present a joint recital with Giuseppe Morello, internationally famous violinist. So Mr. Carlotti's a good pianist. Exactly where does that lead us? It convinces me that Jim Belmont is interested in his movement. But why? I don't know. But I intend to find out in a hurry. Call the depot, find out what time the train arrives and meet him. In the meantime, I'll get all the information I can about Carlotti. <laughs> That's a new one on me, chaperone to pianist. <laughs> I am honored by your presence, Signor Carlotti. What is this outrage? What do you want? Who are you? You may call me Caldwell, Charles Caldwell. Signor Carlotti, I'm going to substitute for you as Morello's accompanist at the concert tonight. Impossible. You're mad. No one can substitute for me. I will have no part of your devilish schemes. You are to telephone Morello that you're obliged to leave the city at once because of a sudden death in your family. You are to say that you are sending your friend, Charles Caldwell, for an audition. No, I will not. Oh, I see it all now. You intend to do some harm to Morello, huh? I'll refuse. And if you refuse, we will smash those highly trained fingers of yours, one by one. No. Morton. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I consent. What do you want me to say? Your speech to Morello is already prepared. Study it carefully. There must be no mistake. Hello? Yes, Joyce, what news? Bad news, I'm afraid. Two men boarded the train at the east side station and persuaded Kalahi to get off there with them. Did you get a description of the men? Not in any detail. I talked to the Pullman conductor, and from the way he described them, one of the men could have been Farrell. And probably was. Anyway, we do know that Carlotti is supposed to play the accompaniment for Morello, the violinist, at a concert tonight. You'd better return here immediately, and we'll go to see Morello at his hotel. Signor Morello? Yes? I'm Professor Caldwell. Yes. My friend Carlotti telephoned that you would come. I trust that I shall be able to take his place as your accompanist. I hope so, although I doubt it. However, it will take but a moment to determine. Excellent. Your 
Your technique is excellent, my friend. We must rehearse at once. I'll get my violin. You know, it's a Stradivarius. So naturally, I keep it under lock and key and allow no one to touch it but myself. Is she not beautiful? Ah, but when you hear her voice... <laughs> Magnificent. I almost regret having to deprive you of it. What? You... You dare! Keep quiet or you won't live. Come in, Farrell. Well, you got it all right. Of course. That's what I came after. Tie him up. Wait here. Well, that's that. Blake, put that violin down, Belmont. You won't need it where you're going. Are you suggesting that a harp would be more appropriate? It will be if you don't drop that gun. Now move over against that wall. to run him off the road. Okay, Chief. I'll stop him. Take my gun and see if you can nick one of their tires when we get within range.
bad Belmont escape, but at least I captured Farrell. Farrell? Yes, I left him at Morello's hotel, handcuffed. So I'll have to fix this tire and hurry back before Belmont gets to him. Losing that Stradivarius violin was bad enough. But having Farrell captured by Blake was even worse. That's right. We need Farrell. Yes, I know. I'll free him as soon as possible. But I can't make any plans until I know what Blake intends to do with him. You can't very well walk into his office and ask him. No. But I can let him sit there and tell us everything we want to know. Water? Oh, yes. Over there. Farrell? No, but I found this in his pocket. I'm quite certain it's the key to a post office box. And if that's where Belmont gets his mail, we're on the right track. Joyce, will you take this key to the postmaster and see if he can tell you which post office branch issued it? All right. That's the last time we'll use that post office. Supposing they can't locate that box for Joyce. Then we'll have agents watch every post office in the city. My dear, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to get Joyce Kingston. With her in my hands, I can force Blake to release Farrell. We'll simply exchange prisoners. That's smart thinking, Jim. Hello. This is Blake. Rita Parker. Listen carefully, Blake. We're holding your secretary a prisoner, and if you want to save her life, you'll have to release Farrell within two hours. Let Joyce come to the phone so I'll know if you're telling the truth. I think I can convince you without that. We got her, she came out of the post office building with that key. Now, do you believe me? Maybe. Remember, you have just two hours to decide. And by the way, don't waste time having agents watch the post office branches. We won't be using the mails from now on. Wait a minute. She hung up. Belmont's holding Joyce a prisoner and threatens her life unless we release Farrell. How do you know? From what Rita Parker said on the telephone. We've got to get Belmont now. Let's question Farrell once more. He won't talk, Jerry. Well, it's worth a try. Come on. Got it. How did you ever guess there was a dictaphone in here? Because Rita spoke of my agents watching the post office branches. And I didn't mention it until after Joyce had left. Then open it up, see what type it is. See what range it has. Anything that will give us a clue. I know this type well. It has a range of only four blocks. It's a lot of buildings within an area of four blocks square. Wait a minute. Look, see this little loop? It's a directional aerial. What position did you find this gadget in? Like that. It's pointing to the north. That means whoever was listening to us is within an area four blocks to the north. This is our district. Let's see what's north of here. The Mid-City Park takes up three blocks. Well, that leaves only one block of buildings to cover. Yeah, those buildings are a department store, a row of small shops, and on this corner, a theater. The old Velasco. But that's been closed for two years. And that's exactly where I think we'll find Belmont's headquarters. Belmont himself in this district? It'd be just like him. He's very daring and always does the unexpected. 
I'm going to take a look at that theatre. Tinkering with the piano backstage. Put her in the closet and then get out of sight. Gone away, Blake. Miss Kingston's already here. Before I ring down the curtain on you, Blake, I would like to know how you found your way here. By the way, haven't you forgotten Farrell? I thought you wanted to exchange him for Miss Kingston. Bring him in, boys.
And when Jim Belmont fired at me, his bullet went through the closet door. I heard a scream and a fall. Later, when I opened the door, she was lying there, dead. It was tough luck for her. It would have been worse luck for me if Rita hadn't hidden herself in the closet. She was standing directly in front of me when Belmont fired through the door. She got the final payoff from her own boss. In the final analysis, even Jim Belmont wasn't so smart. He could easily have been a leader among men if he'd picked an honest profession. Instead of that, all he gets is a police burial. This is the entire file on the Jim Belmont and Associates. Market, case closed. 